Thank you so much for inviting me on to talk about my favourite subject. I'm really delighted to see that you're doing this summit for rescue dogs. Absolutely fantastic work. I mean, they just need so much help and we can give that to them with the knowledge. If we have the knowledge, we can certainly help dogs. And so well done you and thank you for inviting me on. Well, thank you for coming and it's absolutely a pleasure because I know it's going to be absolutely amazing and I'm delighted that people will learn about this beautiful subject. So maybe first things first, can you explain like to our audience, like what is basically, uh, to sum up, a bit of zoopharmacognosy and what do okay. you do? Okay, so what do I do? Zoopharmacognosy, and actually its technical term is applied zoopharmacognosy because zoopharmacognosy on its own uh, is translated into the animal self-medicating in the wild, whereas applied zoopharmacognosy is zoopharmacognosy in a domestic setting. So let's just backtrack again. Zoopharmacognosy then, or applied zoopharmacognosy, is the animal's ability to self-medicate according to presenting symptoms. So that means that the dog has the ability, the dog and um, other mammals have the ability to identify a plant uh, and the medical constituents within that plant and to be able to know that it needs it and to self-dose. So a bit like your dog going out into the garden and eating grass because it knows it's got too much acidity in the stomach and so it's looking for alkaline to reduce the, the to, to, to bring the pH back into balance or maybe a dog eating earth um, in, in order to, um, for, to, to top up the mineral um, content. So, so dogs do this all the time um, in, in the wild, you know, dingoes and all sorts of, uh, you know, dogs have been witnessed uh, self-medicating in the wild. Many animals, there's quite a bit of research now. Um, when I first started uh, zoo pharmacognosy, there's very little research. And now there's a lot more research for animals in domesticated settings, showing how they can self-medicate successfully to restore health. So the word zoo pharmacognosy is broken down zoo, animal, equals animal in Greek, pharma, meaning drug and cognacy to know. So the animal knows its own drug. And as I say, applied zoopharmacognosy then is when we bring that ability and we uh, into a domestic environment and we support the dog or the horse or the cat to self-medicate in a domestic setting. Is that, does that cover it? Is, yeah, that, is that clear? It's, yeah, it's absolutely beautiful. And I, I found it absolutely beautiful. I'm sure our audience is probably like, wow, I didn't know such a thing existed. Also, yeah, yeah, sure. Well, of course, animals have been doing it in the wild for thousands of years. That's how we got here. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not a new science by any stretch of the imagination. We've been doing it, animals have been doing it, birds have been known to do it in uh, the nest, starlings, um, you know, to collect wild carrot seed, plant her, put it in the nest, to line the nest, to help the, their little babies counteract the, the mites uh, that may uh, target them. Um, the, the animals in, in domestic settings, sheep have been uh, demonstrated or have, have shown in studies to self-medicate to reduce worm burden. Um, so, so we've been doing it all the time. Um, it's just, I guess, the the the, the uh, it's only actually come to the fore really as a, a science, um, as a, a studied and observed science. In fact, the word zoopharmacognosy was coined by Elroy Rodriguez in uh, Cornell University in New York. Um, and that was maybe only 20, 30 years ago. I qualified, I started in 2009 and qualified in 2011. I've been doing it only well, for, for over 10 years now. And you're learning all the time. It's an absolute fantastic modality. But the essence of it is, is that the animal leads the way. So the dog leads the way. That, that's, that's the bottom line on everything that the zoo pharmacopathy is involved in. The dog completely leads the session. That's amazing. And could you tell us a bit, because I know you mentioned that you're doing it for the last 10 years, but could you explain us how you got into it? Like, what, how did, how did you start it? it and yeah, what's your background? Yeah. Like, because it's so, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's kind of crazy because I, I, well, my horse has got me into it and then the dogs carried me on because I've always, like you probably have had rescue dogs all my life, you know? Um, and so you're always getting issues coming up. And that's why I was really keen. When I saw you were supporting the rescue dogs, I thought, yeah, that's something really I can get behind, you know. But initially, when I uh, was looking for a re resolution with colic, uh, horses get colic um, and dogs might get bloat. I guess the equivalent in the dog world is bloat. 
So I had a particular mare and she was constantly getting colic or Philly. She was constantly getting colic and I tried everything, homeopathy, Reiki, obviously Buscapan, the vet, you know, um, and just nothing was cutting. And I was reading through this magazine and I saw Zoo and I thought, wow, what kind of a word is that? You know, wow, that's amazing. Uh, and I was just really pulled to it. It was like a, a it was like a message from it was it just resonated so powerfully within me that there's nowhere I was going to let it go. So I um, I checked it out. I qualified with Caroline Ingraham in the UK. That's when she was training practitioners. She doesn't train practitioners anymore, to my knowledge. Um, and so she so I worked with her. Did some case studies workshops past exams that sort of thing and qualified um and uh, i've been doing it ever since up and down the country uh working with dogs and horses um and yeah every case is different it's absolutely amazing so so, so then so yeah so of course i have a saying have rescue dogs and there's one little guy here that we had called stanley and he we had him for 18 years but I think we got him for the rescue. Obviously, when you go to the rescue and you pick out a dog, you don't know how old they are. He was a lurcher. I really wanted a lurcher. Um, and he, I remember him because I was walking down up and down the line of lurchers and he was just bouncing up and down. I just, that's the guy for me. So anyway, took him home and he was actually terrified of everything. You know, he was actually, and, and you know, when you take a rescue dog home, they take, they take time to decompress. You know, they do take time to get used to the new environment. So I used violet leaf. Um, offered violet leaf, frankincense, all sorts of different extracts. And he just really came down so fast. Linden Blossom for trust. So these are all essential oils I'm mentioning here that I'll go into in a bit more depth later on. But I offered him various different herbal extracts and he just really calmed right down. And I could see then straight away that this worked, you know, on dogs as well as horses. Although they are two very different species, obviously. Uh, and so there, there is very different approaches for horses and dogs. Um, so, so yeah, so that's how, and so that's how I started to use it on dogs. And I qualified uh, maybe uh, after doing the horses. Well, actually, when I was doing it with Caroline, there was no distinct specific species. There was you did do pharmacognosies, but then I went back and and she put a program for just dogs. So I did that, um, and so qualified for both dogs and horses. Um, yeah, so that's how I got into it. And, you know, it has to be seen to be believed. I believe you're working as well at the moment with it and, and, and training it. And it's just absolutely incredible um, how they're so accurate. I mean, you just, I wouldn't say you get blasé about it, but you just take it as red now, you know. And, and whilst it's still fascinating me what they select, they, they are so accurate at it. It doesn't, uh, it, it, yeah, it, it's amazing. Yeah, it's um, just beautiful yeah. well, when you start seeing the dog walking with something and you see that you have the reaction. It's just, it's yes. just amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. It, it, it's it's wonderful. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> okay. And, yeah, and can you tell us a bit, like talk a bit about more uh, what it can help with? Because I know you mentioned okay. with rescue dogs, like, um, yeah. not exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, in theory, everything. But I still wouldn't, when a client rings me and says, my dog's got this, that, and the other, can you help? I'll always go through and say, well, what are your options here? You know, is conventional best, for example? You know, or does the, dog, does the dog need to go to a hospital quickly, you know, a veterinary clinic quickly? You know, I mean, there's no good... Um, offering let's say a peppermint oil or wild carrot seed if the dog is gushing from the artery you know they're they're, they're obviously and there are some areas that it responds uh, the do some companies better equipped to deal with than others so um i would say it excels in the emotional areas it excels in areas of fear of phobias of anxieties um also for pain and inflammation it excels because you know in traditional medicine conventional medicine um, there is, is a couple of painkillers, a couple of analgesics. Whereas in the zoo farm, if I'm just kid, you've got seven, eight, nine, ten different types of analgesics that you can offer that the dog will select. In fact, our team vet, Annette, we had her here and she was, this is before she was on our team. And she was, she said, oh, I'm really into this herbal stuff now. I've got this, um, this herb um, that we're going to give for analgesics as a painkiller. So I said, OK, let's have a look at this and see what happens. So she gave the, the, the painkiller and then we offered, I think, what drug, what uh, herb was it? It wasn't devil's chloride, it was another one. Ah. Um, 
Anyway, oh, she offered that she she put the herb, gave the pill to the, the horse or the medication to the horse as a herb, and then we offered devil's claw, and the horse wanted devil's claw. So it just goes to show that that particular analgesic necess hadn't necessarily worked, and that the horse preferred analgesic. Oh, meadow sweet, that was it. So um, so you know, we could see that the horse had selected another type of painkiller to work with, and it, it would be exactly the same with dogs. I, you know, you could give a dog an analgesic and then you'd offer it St. John's Ward or Arnica and it would still select that because the actual painkiller that has been prescribed doesn't actually match the condition or doesn't it match the, the pathway that's required. Um, so, so yeah, so the, the dog's so much more accurate at, at actually uh, picking out exactly the type of painkiller that they need. So it's accurate for pain. As I say, emotional issues, digestive issues, we've had huge success um, with bloat. Now, that's not something that I would recommend people do on their own. You know, I say first thing, bloat to the vet. You know, but I have had a great result uh, with bloat, uh, digestive issues, diarrhea, um, uh, oh gosh, so many. Um, uh, yeah, anxieties. Um, we'll come to a few case studies soon yeah. um, with rescue dogs. Yeah, so so in theory, everything and anything, but I would, but, but, but there are some things that it works better than others. And again, um, it depends also about whether you're looking at secondary conditions or secondary issues on top of primary issues. So, for example, you might have a gut issue and it might be, have a skin irritation. So it's good for, for, for gut issues as well. Um, but then it might have you have a secondary issue with, let's say, a fungal infection. So, you know, sometimes you've got various different layers to get through. And as we know, antibiotics can damage the whole immune system. So if you've got a dog with gut infection and you're giving it antibiotics, now, listen, I'm, I'm not, this is not a, let's slag conventional medicine, okay? This is about getting the right balance of everything. Um, um, but, but um, you know, because I, I very much do, do support conventional medicine as well. You know, I, I believe an integrated approach is required, not just one or the other. I do really believe and support an integrated approach. In fact, I'm doing a talk on it at an equine conference next week uh, on the integrated approach. So I really do, do strongly um, support that. But, but at the same time, if a medicine is doing, a prescribed medicine is doing more damage, um, you know, and it's giving side effects, then let's look at the alternatives. So for example, skin irritations and itching, um, you might find that that's due to something stuck in the gut or some imbalance in the gut that's then causing a fungal infection. And so you need to, to look at both uh, presenting symptoms and, and work with both. So, so it is, it is good in that it, it works with the body and it works with what the dog needs as opposed to, um, you know, as I say, minimum, very minimum invasive and minimum side effects. Um, so yeah, so we've had results in lots of different areas. And actually, Panis is, well, sorry, I won't jump the gun there. That's another uh, case study that I'm going to talk about later. So, okay. so um, a lot of things it can work with. Okay. And could you talk about the different products uh, like that you use and the difference between them as well? Okay. So, Frankie, we have over 120 extracts in our mm -hmm. kit, right? <laughs> now, you're not going to use all of those in one day. I hope, otherwise there's something going wrong. Um, for dogs, you know, because we cover all species, right? Okay, so we ship to Spain, to India, to Australia, you know, we ship everywhere and we ship to various, to, to, sorry, to, to um, various different species. So, but from a dog point of view, uh, floral waters is definitely the way in initially because floral waters are incredibly gentle. They've also got a wider range of constituents um, these, not to be confused, these uh, floral waters are not to be confused with the uh, byproduct of the essential oil distillation. So these are, are aromatic waters in their own right, and they have a wide range of constituents. They're very gentle, um, and we sell them in spray bottles. So floral waters is really the best ones for dogs. Um, initially and then you might move over to essential oils who are, which are more potent and are created uh, manufactured through a distillation process so you you end up with a smaller um, uh, range of constituents active ingredients but they're more potent as a result of the distillation process um, and then we have powders or sorry dried herbs which aren't uh, 
the, the, the tubers, let's say devil's claw might be pop, more popular, and the, the rose hips, you know, so the roots, more for dogs, I would offer roots and, and the berries, um, uh, or the fruit, which you say would be rose hips. Um, less, let's say, you know, dried herb, comfrey. Um, so, so it's more the roots of so echinacea, um, devil's claw, uh, dandelion root, grape for the kidneys. Um, so it's more the roots that we'd offer. Um, and then the powders are essentially the roots either um, ground up and milled up or um, the um, or sometimes the, the leaves, like nettle leaf, you might offer that as a powder. Um, so it's, 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 it's the roots for dogs, it's the floral waters, it's the essential oils. CO2 is another whole range that we have. So Arnica CO2 is very good. And it's not as strong. The Arnica, the CO2s are created in a different, uh, through a different process using carbon dioxide. Um, and it's not heated, so therefore you don't damage or lose any of the constituents because it's not heated. So it's, it's a process where a carbon dioxide is as a gas. It starts as a liquid, created into a gas, breaks down the cells within the plant, and then the constituents are um, extracted um, that way. And there's no residue left uh, because it, the gas then turns back into a liquid. So, um, so, so CO2s are, again, more gentle. Um, um, not as gentle as the floral waters, let's say, but they're still very gentle. And again, a wider constituent. So a wider range of uh, constituents within the plants. Um, so we have Arnica, we have a calendula, very popular. Um, we, I, t I t personally, I mean, there are a few practitioners in the field, but personally, I leave the macerates out. I very, very rarely offer macerates anymore. Macerates are more fatty. They are the plant uh, distilled into or steeped in an oil, such as almond oil or, or, or sunflower oil. And they are, um, they, you know, with dogs, obesity, obesity is huge. We don't know what's going on with the liver. Can it... Um, you know, break down these fats. So we're trying to avoid fats. So, so yeah, so that's it in a nutshell. Probably I'm going into a bit more depth, aren't I? Too much depth. So, so yes, so every extract has its place in the kit. Yeah. And could you explain a bit, like I know you mentioned that it's basically the dogs that self-selected and self-medicates with mm. the help of the owner, obviously. But mm. could you explain like how, how it works basically? Um, okay, so you mean how a session works, or uh, actual... no, just generally. Well, or you can explain the, the, yeah. how you start a session as well. Maybe you can start um, like that. How do how, yeah, explain how okay. a session works? Okay. And what okay. do you start with? And... So, so you you look at the presenting symptoms. Quite often, dogs have come to me have already had a diagnosis, and they might be you know they've already been to a vet and they've already had their bloods done, and this is the issue. Right? Okay, so you know where to start. You know what extracts to be selected for what. Um, so, so how it actually works, how a session goes around is that you initially you want to bring the dog into a place of engagement. And if it's in a strange area, sometimes they go out to people's houses, uh, in which case it's a bit easier. But if they come here, then you're starting with uh, a, a dog that's in a strange surroundings. Now, it all depends upon the dog's relationship with the owner. And if they're used to traveling, you know, there are many, many different factors that come into play here. But essentially, you will offer according to presenting symptoms. So if a dog is anxious, you might offer, well, first of all, trust, you'd offer um, extracts that are often selected for trust. Um, and then when you, the dog is engaged and I have his full attention or her attention, then we look at offering for the, the different presenting symptoms. So, for example, um, well, let, let's get a, a case study here, shall we? Yeah. Can we yeah. get a case study? Yeah. Um, so, okay. So, um, okay. I've got to share screen first, haven't I? It's crikey. Um, uh, I think so, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully you so, can. Can you? Okay, so this is this is dog, right? Okay, so this is dog. Dog oh. came to, and that is her name. Okay, <laughs> uh, I, I lo much loved dog, a much loved German Shepherd dog, um, and um, she came to me with Panis. So Panis is when the eyes, it's an autoimmune disease, and the eyes start to uh, cloud over, and it's the growth that goes over the eyes. Okay, um, so she had been to the vet, been diagnosed with Panis. 
and uh, pass is generally considered incurable, but they just put uh, immunosuppressants, dog was on, immu dog was on immunosuppressants to um, stop, uh, to try and slow down the deterioration of her eyesight. She was banging into things. It was really, really upsetting for the owners. So she came to us um, and I worked with her. I spoke to the team at first to see what medication, you know, what, you know, how, did, were there any contraindications or known contraindications to work with uh, or to be aware of? Um, and so we, uh, there weren't, or what once were, we were able to isolate and, and leave out the extracts that, that we felt could be tricky. So we offered Arnica, Spirulina, various different extracts. Um, and uh, it, was, it was amazing. Within, tw within two weeks, it cleared up. Now, I mean, this is just, it's normally generally considered incurable. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the trick or the, the, the success, success was down to as well that they, I'm sure um, Berenice won't mind me mentioning her name. It was down to the fact that Berenice went home and diligently, diligently re-offered her extracts on the day. So she selected um, extracts for anger, for, um, for eyes, so corn flour water, uh, licorice for, for the liver and for the eyes, because the liver is very much connected to the eyes, um, arnica, spirulina, and a few others. But the key ones were spirulina and arnica and corn flour. And, and as I say, she turned around within two weeks. Now that's absolutely unheard of. And it wasn't just the, uh, interesting enough, it wasn't just the eyes that came back, the whole, uh, you know, her whole digestive system improved. She put on weight, she was full of energy. So, so it wasn't, the eyes, if you like, were just the presenting symptom. Uh, or just the most obvious presenting yeah. symptoms. There were many other symptoms and yeah. it was a whole condition there that she resolved. Um, that 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 uh, dog results. So it was absolutely incredible. So so we started. Um, so dog had a great relationship, or still does, as far as I know, with the Berenice. And so there was no need for trust issues. Uh, you know, they didn't come to the fore. So we could go straight in with the session. So as it, again, it depends the way you start with the dog and the beginning of the session. Really does depend upon where the dog is at in itself. Is it anxious? Is it fearful? Um, so you would offer extracts, as I say, to get them to engage, to encourage them to engage, and then you carry on with extracts according to presenting symptoms. Mm. And do you do you offer the same, like all the products at the same time, or do you start with a specific problem? You, you start with a gentle product, I suppose, initially. Yeah, you start with floral waters initially. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, unless the dog has had lots of uh, lots of sessions beforehand, and then and then you might go in with a, uh, uh, but but it's unlikely. Usually, it, it's you'll go you'll you'll start with floral waters. Yeah. Um, or if the dog is is doesn't go there, uh, won't go there, then then um, I will put things on plates on the floor because yeah. they associate that with eating. Now yeah. they won't. It just, just, it's just, it's just me saying hi. I'm friendly. I'm going to feed you. Yeah. Now then, they go along the plates and they and these yeah. extracts. There's no calorific value the extracts that we we offer. So they're not going to select them because they're hungry. They will select them because yeah. their body is telling them they need them. Yeah. Um. So that's another way we might go in by putting um supplemental um extracts on plates. You know, stuff like rose hips, spirulina, barley yeah. grass, those sort of powders that that the dog will select. Yeah. Um, and what about the depoders? Would you at what stage would you offer them? Oh, if you the do powders, them? yeah, yeah, it depends. Years. Upon, yeah. It, yeah, it depends upon where the dog is going. Um, you know, you you have a game plan when you when the dog comes to you and you you've obviously done lots of background and you know with with the owner, you know what's going on. Um, it, it really does depend upon in your head. You have okay, so I'm going to offer for um, a bit of sun. That's unusual. <laughs> To, you know, it's too, too little sun. Okay, I don't I hate to block the sun out. Um, oh. But yeah, so so um, it, it depends upon where the dog wants to go. So you might have powders out, and the dog's going, "I'm not interested in any of that," but I'm still anxious, or I'm still not going to trust you. So then you might move over to floral waters, as I say, or then you might go to linden blossom absolute. So the absolutes are a different type of essential that again are more gentle. 
Um, so, so it all depends upon, you, you have a game plan and you have to be prepared to switch at any point in time yeah. because the dog yeah. might go, I'm not interested in anything that is, is yeah. that appears for my presenting symptoms. I want to go to the emotional side of things. Or you might think the dog has an emotional issue, but then it's really pain that is the yeah. problem. You know, so so many dogs that are in pain and they won't get in the car and they're anxious and people think it's anxiety from traveling. Yes, it is. But the root cause of that can often often be pain. They say, well, he doesn't look like he's in pain or she doesn't look like in pain, but they often can be. Um, historical pain is a big issue for dogs. Yeah, if they've been spayed, they've been neutered, a dog tails, dog ears, all these sort of things can leave shock in the system and leave pain in the system that's really undetectable through conventional means. But um, but certainly they feel it. Um, yeah. That was actually my next question. Like, does it happen? Uh, but no, it's just because from hearing you talking, does it happen that, you know, you get cold and you think, okay, the background is, I don't know, a kidney problem, a high problem, yeah. and it turns yeah. out it's actually something completely different that the owners are All the time. Yeah. All the time. <laughs> Not all the time, that's an exaggeration, but no. a lot of the time, actually a lot of the time, because quite often, as I was saying about, say, the fungal infection, infection covering a gut infection or as a result of a gut infection, quite often the obvious symptom isn't where the dog wants to work with first. You know, it's a secondary issue. Yeah. So, so and that is the beauty again of zoo pharmacognosy is the dog knows what they need and they yeah. know where the crux and the root of the problem is. Yeah. You know, where the MRI hasn't shown it. You know, or the X-ray hasn't shown it, or the yeah. bloods haven't shown it. Shown. You know, so it's really very powerful modality to work with. Yeah. And do you find some time hard actually to maybe for that reason know the background? Because then you think, oh, you might be influenced and think, oh, that should be the problem. But the dog doesn't respond to that. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Do you hear what I mean? No, because my training or uh, my experience has shown me that we, we work directly with what's in front of us. Yeah. And the yeah. dog leads. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, I'm, and, and it's really important to, to stick to that. If you stick to that, you won't go too far wrong. If you yeah. stick to the fact that it's the dog leading. Now, you might take longer if you have in your mind, and I've learned to let go of that, but if you have in your mind, yeah. this is what we're going to do, then you're yeah. going to get nowhere. I know. I you, know, know. I you need know. to really work with where the dog, follow the dog, follow the dog, and you won't go wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. I, I do hear what you're saying. And, and that's another area. I mean, it's interesting because when I was looking through, you know, what I was going to talk to you about and at rescue dogs, I think oh, trauma, yeah, trauma, rescue dogs, trauma. But I, I come across dogs that have been in homes and they have trauma issues. Yeah. And they've, and they've been in the home since they were a puppy. So, I mean, it's obviously you kind of don't want to say, hey, listen, this dog is selecting for trauma. But now I can say, because the science has shown that trauma can be inherited. We have seen it in, we have, we have studies to prove now that trauma can be passed down four generations, four wow. generations. Wow. So your dog might be exhibiting, and, and they're not even, they've had no trauma that you can identify. Uh, and, 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 you know, from a puppy, you might have, you might bred them yourselves, and yet they're still showing signs of fear, lack of trust, uh, and shock. And and it could well be that their great grandfather, or you know, has experienced trauma, um, and and then passed it on. And as I say, the science is there now to back it up. They've they've shown studies, not in dogs, but in mammals um, and, and mice. Unfortunately, the poor old mice they always get such a hard time. Uh, but our, the, the the member. We've just taken on a new team member, Dr. Silk Kleefeld, and uh, she works for Galway University, and that's her area um, of, of speciality is, is looking after uh, looking after the welfare of the mice within laboratory conditions, oh. within laboratory yeah. testing. Yeah, tough call, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. and 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 um, you know this is so. So the mice do have um, um, a, a someone like Dr. Silk Kleefeld looking after their interests. Good. But so so they have shown anyway that mice um, fourth generation still show signs of stress wow. uh, when when they've and yeah yeah are, you know and they have no reason to. They've been brought up with their mothers. You know, but they're still showing signs of stress from four, four, four generations back. Oh, so yeah, so so coming back to dogs, how what does that mean to dogs? If your dog is selecting or is for trauma, it doesn't mean to say it's necessarily traumatized. It means that it has the trauma gene and that it may have yeah. been expressed. I mean, you talk about epigenetics and expressing genes through nurture and nature. 
We don't want to get too sciencey, yeah. yeah. but there's an awful lot to it than just um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so yes. So sorry, I've gone off track a bit. Um, no, it's fine. <laughs> Uh, blah, 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 blah. And so, I was going to ask you, yeah, the, what about the owners? Because you say, yeah, that's fine. Uh, but like sometimes, you know, if the owner is convinced that the, the dog's problem is this, then it turns out, right. what else right. is the reaction? Because okay. I'm okay. sure it'd be like, okay, that's where I was going. That's where I went off. Oh, piece, good. Wasn't it, for a bit. <laughs> yeah. So, so what I was trying to say was, we all come with a story. All of us, me, everyone, you, we all have a story in our head, right? We all have this internal dialogue going, oh, this is what's happened. This is why this is happening. This is what I remember. And, and, you know, when I'm teaching students, I say, let go of that story. And it's the hardest thing ever because we invest in stories and particularly about rescue dogs, right? Oh, I got this rescue dog. Oh, this has happened. This has happened. Blah, 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 blah. Now, we know that when we take a rescue dog into a home, a lot of TLC, a lot of love and care is huge healing in itself. It's massive healing in itself. Giving that dog security, giving it a pack to be part of, giving it a pack leader. I know we don't go for the dominance theory anymore, so I'm not saying I advocate, you know, you are the boss. But, you know, giving it security, giving it a pal, um, giving it someone that, that knows it feels safe, it can hunt and, and protect, you know, be protected with... Uh, um, by um, it's huge it's huge healing in itself so um when someone does come to me with a story I, I i don't say listen let go of that story but i do try and encourage them to understand that that you know the dog is happy where it is is presenting these presenting symptoms but, but and we can work with that uh, and and um and, and also say, yes, it may have a liver issue, it may have a kidney issue, and these are very correct diagnoses, but I can only follow what your dog actually wants and what it needs, what it's telling me it needs right now. Now, in, the, in the, the second session, it may say it wants to take dandelion root for kidneys, or it may want uh, sandalwood, um, you know, or lemon uh, for, for kidney stones, or it may well want um, um, rose for the heart, you know, or yarrow for, for unresolved issues or, you know, so so generally by the time a client comes to me, they have an idea of the way it works and they're happy with that. So they're willing to go with just following the dog. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Well, that's how it works. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, there's no administering. There's absolutely no administering. There's no treating. Mm. It's about offering and uh, them selecting. Yeah. Yeah. And how long do session last okay, now and a half be... is the maximum a dog will right. really give focus yeah. okay. unless unless they have a break sometimes i mean that's generally the norm unless they have a break and they decide that they you know sometimes it's just if it's really intense if the dog is just so wants to get into it straight away it, you, you know you can have stuff resolved or you know some really deep work done within 20 minutes and then I might just say, hey, guys, just, let's just go out. Let's go for a walk along the lane. Let's just take a break, you know, or sometimes it's too intense for the owner. Yeah. You know? Because there is a connection. There is a network without a doubt. And I'm not sure if there's any science on this. There probably is. Uh, I know there is for horses, but I haven't researched the science on dogs as yet. But but there's definitely a link between the heart rate between um horses and yeah. uh, owners and i should imagine someone's done some research to show the rate uh, that the link between humans and their dogs you know, yeah probably yeah. more so than horses yeah. i would say definitely it's more so so yeah. you're dealing with an energy network so when you're working with a, a, a session with a with a dog you're also in effect taking into consideration the energy of the owner um, and, and so they might, I mean, God, yeah, I've had owners in tears and owners <laughs> laughing and, you know, it's a really emotional experience as yeah. well for the owner because there is such a close network between themselves and their dogs. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't have to tell you that, you know yourself. Um, and most of the people watching will really appreciate that, that they, there's this, just this, 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 this heart connection between themselves and the dog. So the owner might decide, it's, I might say, I might say, okay, let's just stop for 20 minutes yeah. or 10 minutes because the owner is just, it's just too intense as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So session generally an hour and a half can spin out a bit longer if we take regular breaks in between. Yeah. Yeah. And how many sessions do they usually need? Does a dog need that? Like, is there a oh. case where you, you only need one? No, that's very How long is the piece of string? No, listen, I generally, <laughs> no. If, if the follow-up is good, 
than, than one session. And, and what, what, how it generally works is you have one session uh -huh. um, and then the, I send you home or the, 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 the lady home or man home or the, the owner home yeah. with the extracts and they continue to re-offer. All oh, right, okay. Yeah. I do an awful lot on Zoom now, actually. Oh, I do okay. It most, I do it nearly all on Zoom. Um, right, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because then I can do it, work with America, people in America, people all over the world, then it's just, you know. It's, so you usually do the first one in person and then the follow up on Zoom? It's, it's, entirely, up, it, it's oh, entirely, it's entirely, oh, it, it, it entirely up to how the dog is. A lot of dogs don't travel well and if they're yeah. sick, the last thing you want to stick them in the back of the car, because I'm in Sligo, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, the yeah. last thing you want to do is stick your dog in the back of the car for three hours if you're coming from Dublin. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. That's yeah. Just, just, doesn't make sense you know you're trying to help the dog not, not persecute it so, yeah so so you don't want to put it through a long journey so i do a lot of work on zoom and that's okay. really it's very easy to do okay um, and how, do, owner, how does it work then because, yeah but the owner then does the offering so i right. will instruct and guide the owner now some people have a natural aptitude for it and some people don't so that yeah. that is a consideration to take in and that's something to take into consideration so uh, if the dog comes here, then yes, that's fine. I will do all the offering. But if it's on Zoom, then the owner actually does the offering. Right. So then the owner will carry on with a follow-up. So that might be a week. So the key extracts that the dog has selected are um, either they are, they, um, yeah, the, so the owner takes those home in the event of them coming here. And then they will continue on the offering until the dog um, doesn't select any further. Mm. So the okay. Panis dog, for example, was uh, just the one session. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's wow. let's have a look for another. Um, okay. So Nunu here. Nunu was um, unfortunately she's no longer with us. Oh. Um, she was in the Canicross um, uh, Canicross uh, Championships. So you know that that where you know the dog has a harness and and you run along behind them. Um, so, so, so she was struggling to get into a car to travel the ferries, and all she wanted was St John's Ward. That's all she wanted, and she was absolutely fine after that. So, St John's Ward is a nervine; it's a painkiller, um, and she didn't want it all the time. She just had it for a while, for a week, and then she was absolutely fine going forward. So, so again, um, so, so that was just one session, and yet it, it looked like she it was you know it was it could have been a lot longer, you know because the presenting symptoms were so fit, fit, severe. You know, she really was just really unhappy traveling. But it was literally just St. John's Ward that sorted her out, that helped her, uh, that she selected. And actually, she came to a demonstration. Uh, she's a Rhodesian Ridgeback. Um, yeah. And actually, the person was so impressed, she now works in the shop for us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, she actually came and bought the team. So she's actually the lady that owns some uh, this this particular lady uh, and Rhodesian, her, you know, her favourite dog of choice is Rhodesian Ridgeback, and now she works in the shop with us. So right. that's that's Nunu. So that was just one session. Mm, okay. Um, okay. So let's take this little guy. This is a puppy that my son bought uh, oh. home uh, last um, last year. The spaniel puppy, yeah. yeah, and he had a really bad eye. Oh. And he'd been through the river, so we think maybe he'd picked something up, or he had a couple of, you can see the inflammation in the eyes there. And and that was a couple of, it was it was a couple of offerings, not a full session, St. John's Walk, corn flour, elderflower for the yeah. eyes, yeah. German chamomile, essential oil. That's quite a mild essential oil. It's not mm. maybe as strong as, let's say, frankincense or, yeah. you know. Um, so, so, and that was just, uh, offering about five extracts uh, in the morning and five extracts in the evening, and the next day it was absolutely fine. Okay. Um, so, so it's so it really does depend on um, how many layers of issues there are. So again, going back to the digestive issue, you know, you could then have be a couple of issues uh, going on there. It could be also emotional. I mean, I really don't think we can understate the emotional component oh, yeah. to, to to physical issues and and. Uh, again, I mean, I have Dr. Silk Cleefield on the case looking to, sh to prove um, or to look for science uh, and studies to show that there is always an emotion or that there is an emotional component that is uh, that, uh, that to, uh, to a physical disease in the body. Um, 
a kind of relatively new way of thinking, relatively, I say, uh, but it's certainly something I work with. You know, it, it's something that I always keep in the equation of everything. So if a dog comes to me with gut issues or, and they're not able to assimilate nutrients, I will look at emotional issues. I will go straight, okay, feelings of self-worth, you know, elang elang. Hmm. Self worth. So I will look at, always, always look at the emotional component to a dis ease in the body. Yeah, yes. I just think it's a no brainer. I really yeah, do. Yeah, and yeah. yeah, absolutely. For me, anyway, for where I am in my, in, in my experience, I always, always look at an emotional component. So, for example, uh, front legs, I would look to the dog's heart, hmm. you know, okay, because so the front legs are often fed by the energy of the front of the heart. So, you know, the blood flows into, uh, in, into, the, into the heart. Uh, sorry, into the, the front legs, and, and if there's any issues in the front legs, uh, I, I will look straight away to emotional issues of the heart. Uh, so it'd be rosato, yarrow. Um, yeah, um, liver. If, it, if there's going on with the liver, okay, so you'd offer licorice root and also cornflour and wild carrot seed and lime, but you would also offer for anger because often the body holds anger in the liver. Mm. So, you know, I would very much be a proponent of that type of approach uh, too, because, I, you know, it, it's, it's a no-brainer to me that we hold emotions in our body. And actually, Silk did come up with a study to show how um, the brain can be affected by trauma and how sometimes reprogramming the brain is, is, is a way to remove the pain in the body. But anyway, yeah. there's not a huge yeah. amount of science on that. But... Um, yeah, crikey, I've gone off piece again, haven't I? This is the trouble. Oh, it's it's, 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 talking. It, it's just it's, because, no, it's, it's such a, like, dense subject. And there's so many things to talk about, but it's yeah. beautiful. It's great. It's awesome. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. I was um, going to add a question as well, because you mentioned, uh, I'm going off track as well, but you mentioned uh, right. Zoom session, you know, that you mainly work on them. How do you do, like, do you send them a kit in advance because you don't know yeah. them? Oh, yeah, exactly. Okay. There's quite a bit of collaboration leading up to that. Right. So somebody might say, my dog is A, B, and C, and I will recommend extracts. Now, unfortunately, because of the nature of zoo pharmacognosy, there's no administering. Yeah. So, you know, you're talking about 200 to 250 just to start with um, of, of, of purchasing extracts. Um, and and um, so, so and, and then we'll work through them. Now, I get it right 90% of the time, yeah, you know, yeah. the dog were, you know, I, I'm pretty, you know, I've been doing this for a while now, but I yeah. still can't guarantee it. Of course. You know? yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, um, so there is an initial outlet. Yeah, there is for sure of the extracts. Um, and then, uh, but if you've got one or two dogs, you're going to always use those extracts yeah. at some point in time. You know, that's, that's, yeah, that's, right. uh, that's a given, you know, at, at some point in time, you or your dogs will need those. Um, so, so yes, it, it's the pre-purchase of extra, right. uh, um, and and then we work on the Zoom session, and and then we have a follow up a week later, follow up right. chat a week later to see how things have gone, uh, and to see and and I'm obviously I'm available throughout that week yes. just to you know to check in and just if you're concerned about you know I don't just drop you and leave and run, mm. you know there is access to me throughout that week uh, while you're doing the follow up extracts. You know, it does take an eye. You, you do, it, it, it's, 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 you, it is an observer of science, right? Okay, so that means you have to really hone in and give 100% attention to your dog. And if you're not able to do that, if you need to be scrolling or if you need to be on the phone or there's Jack coming in the door or you're cooking, you, know, there's, you can't do it unless you're 100% focused. Um, so that can be a challenge for some people, and I do explain that at the beginning. Listen, you've got to this, you've got to be totally present for your yeah. dog. You know, there's no answering the phone or, or yeah, as I say, it, it's you've got to be there. Um, which in this day and age is tricky enough, you know, because yeah. we're being present is is. But it, it, it's, you'll find if you're into it, just you look at the clock and it's gone. Yeah. Like you, yeah. it's just fascinating. It's just. You really start to home in and, and just look for those twitches, watch the breathing, <clears throat> excuse me, watch the breathing, um, watch um, any twitches, nervous twitches, any pulsations, any blinking, watch the eyes. Uh, you know, actually, I'm going to show you here a guy. I was just going to ask you, uh, yeah. how, do you what's, how do you recognize that a dog wants something if you have anything okay. to show us? Yeah. Well, can, uh, can you, yeah, you can see Noah there. That was at the Galway Rescue Center. Can you see him, Jared? Yep. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so he was incredible because, it, I mean, you can see he's obviously putting his nose over the bottle. Okay, <laughs> yeah. so that's quite obvious, you know, that, that guy wants that. But later on through the session, he okay. he just he just zonked. He just completely zonked on the oils, um, and and he was very very subtle. So uh, German Shepherds, white German Shepherds, incredibly smart. All dogs are smart, given the opportunity, you know. To, to, I mean, just, just to put a bit of context here, we have 5 million olfactory cells. Well, oh, I skipped over that, didn't I? Dogs have a VNO, a von Ron nasal organ, also called a Jacobson organ, yeah. over the guy that discovered it, okay? So it's a VNO, what I call a VNO for sure. Yeah, it's easier. The VNO is a secondary olfactory organ. We only have one that we know of, okay? So um, a von Ron nasal organ means that they have a heightened sense of ability and sense of smell. So we put that into context. We have 5 million olfactory receptors, okay? They have about 500 million receptors. So that's that's an awful lot more than we have, um, you know, 500 million. That's why, I don't know if you saw on TV once, they did this, um, uh, uh, I suppose it was for entertainment, entertainment value, but it did get the message across. They got a boat and they put it out into the lake and they uh, the guy in the boat and he dropped a piece of meat into the bottom of the lake somewhere, right? They then took a spaniel out, okay? And and they got the spaniel to tell them where the meat was. And that, that piece of meat was wrapped in plastic at the bottom of the lake mm. but they still he still found okay. that now a dog can scent an aromatic particle one in a trillion okay mm. so that's no. how capable they are one in a trillion so so they have an incredible sense of smell so look how close that noah noah that's his name noah's dog noah was the dog saying how close he was to the bottle really really close Mm. Um, so that's how much he was getting for that. So how much he needed it, and how much he wanted it, and mm. and that VNO is connected. The von organ, the secondary olfactory organ, is connected to the hypothalamus, to the limbic brain, uh, which contains the hypothalamus or the hypothalamus and the hippocampus. So mm. the hypothalamus is responsible for homeostasis within the body. The hippocampus is responsible for our memories. Uh, and, and it plays a part in our memories. So you can see how um, that just smelling for a dog, it has an impact physiologically, emotionally, and mentally. Mm. So so that's how it actually works. Um, that was a question for me a while back, and I didn't answer it thoroughly, but I'm answering it now. <laughs> so, yeah, so you can see, um, yeah, so this guy was just completely anxious. And do you know what it was? It, we, okay, we did the session, and they didn't have time to follow up because they have like hundreds of dogs okay so there's no way they would i mean i did leave the oils with them but i didn't think that they could do the follow-up but what they did do was he wanted coconut oil and he oh. wolfed down coconut oil and as we know coconut oil is full of vitamins and minerals that a dog needs and lacking those um vitamins and minerals so i'm trying to get out of the sun here um a bit closer to it so it's not quite so um so yeah, so so um, so the anxiety reduced as soon as he had coconut oil. So uh, yeah, so he he you know he had that one session, but the, the reduction in anxiety was there because of the, the the coconut oil. Really, he just wolfed down jars of it. In fact, I went down the road and got some more and brought it back. <laughs> um, yeah, so so I, I don't know what he was after that. You know, I, I don't know how he got on eventually, but um, certainly. Um, he he was so smart, so quick to engage. That was his first time with the oils, you know, yeah. um, and he really, really calmed down during the session. Really, right. really calmed yeah. But I suppose um, it's not always such obvious. You mean such dramatic results? No, 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 not the result. Uh, the how you call it? The wanting to to walk with the oil so that uh, he actually has the nose on top of oh, the Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But can you explain yeah. like the different signs that, you know, basically, because we know that it is about self-selection. Yeah. But how yeah. do they tell you, okay, I want this, or actually, or, no, I'm not too keen on that. Can okay. you talk about that? Just I, I, I can't, because I tell you, that is, I mean, I could do, I could spend the next three hours doing it, no, no. but A, we could lose everybody. <laughs> And I think also, I think we need to be really mindful of the fact that 
this it takes training right mm. this is not something you can do just through a webinar you know um it, it, it um like okay so so noah was very close to that bottle okay now you might get a dog and you might spray a floral water and the dog might move his head away and you might think oh he doesn't want it but that might not be the case because he might be reducing the dis uh, re reducing the potency by moving his head away but he might hold his head still away but he's still inhaling hmm. the bottle sorry this is all reverse isn't it on zoom so <laughs> Getting a, my spatial awareness is a bit dodgy. So, so you might, so, so what? So you could easily overface a dog. You could really, um, but by, by trying to do it, by learning from me talking now, I, I'm, I, I wouldn't recommend that. What I would say would get on a course. Um, there, there is. I mean, I suppose the bottom line is, if the dog leaves the room, he doesn't want it. That's yes. the one way you know. That's about the only way you know for sure they don't want it. Also, he, sometimes, sometimes they just want to break as well. And yeah, might, and, and so and it's say, not and actually, Yeah, and actually, that might not even be the case yeah. because that might have been a, a, an instant reaction to an oil yeah. is going. Oh, okay, I need to walk. I need to yeah. walk this off. I need to yeah. walk this anxiety off. So it might. So, so every every movement, every response is valuable, and it's yeah. often the response that you look at after the selection. Mm. You know, so the walking out of the room. I mean, especially if he walks out of the room and stays out, <laughs> then you're thinking, okay, this guy's not, you know, doesn't want to continue anymore. But but it, it's it's so subtle. I know. Dogs, yeah. it's so subtle with dogs, and it's so intricate and it's so detailed. Um, and the, so the, different for each dog as well. So and that's, yeah. exactly every dog has its own mo mm. every dog has its own modus operandum mm. you know so it's really tricky to say you know i just i don't feel comfortable giving you a sort of a blanket answer yeah. i'm afraid to that mm. Mm. yeah no no but that, that's kind of the answer that i was you know like every case is <laughs> kind of different and you know but how do you um how do you when, when you meet the dog for the first time how uh. How do you understand, you know, how do you, I suppose it's from your experience, how do you interpret, yeah. you know, how do you manage to interpret, I suppose, from the experience, yeah. I suppose. Well, listen, take Bonzo here, I've just thrown yeah. a picture of Bonzo. Bonzo, oh. is, you can see, is a rescue dog, incredibly skinny, uh, yeah, from yes, Met yes. Mayo, um, but he landed on his feet, he met a lovely woman called Mary Loftus. And she took it, she actually runs boarding kennels and uh, she implements zoo farm the cognacy in with her boarding. Um, you know, if they're anxious, she'll get a spray out. She'll get a linden blossom. If, if, you know, if they're fearful, she might get the frankincense or the valerian, if, uh, you know. So she works with it quite a lot. So um, so this is this is Bonzo. And, and he had never been in a house before. He had never, or, or, or it would appear that he just was absolutely terrified of being in four walls. Um, and, and so we very slowly coaxed him in with oils. Um, and then uh, that's violently, if you can see there, that he's selecting. So, um, it, you know, it, 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 you're right, it's experience. It really is according to, you know, you kind of zone in. After doing it for a while, it's almost like subconsciously, you kind of zone in and say, okay, you get a feeling what, what yeah. you know, what to start with. So there's no hard and fast rule, although during training, it's always cornflower. You start with the cornflower mm -hmm. because that does help them to engage. Yeah. But also at the same time, you might, if they're fearful, linden blossom or rose is a nice one as well to start with, particularly for young dogs. Or again, as I say, um, it might be spirulina or, or plates on, on the floor. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, sorry, I'm not sure that I'm repeating myself, so I'm not sure I'm it's asking, an answering what... You want to know. It's 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 absolutely fine. Yeah, no, it's fine. Um, yeah. Um, do you sometimes start like start with nutrients like spirulina or do you not? Yeah, I, yeah. It, it really does depend upon. I mean, I guess at the beginning I might have done. I, yeah. Um, I mean, I I I yeah, that little spaniel out there. Um, he's on raw food. Okay, right. and initially we brought him, well, my son brought him home and he was on kibble. Mm. So we kept that initially just to, so he you know, didn't want to make a radical change to the diet to start with because everything was new. So we thought the one thing that was consistently he knew was his kibble. 
So we gave him his kibble to start with. And I would put down nutritional supplements. Yeah. Okay. And he would take nutritional supplements. I take a few, right? And then slowly we weaned him onto raw food. And I put a post up, I think, two days ago of him. And I put down yeah. the nutritional supplements. Yeah. None. He didn't want one. All he wanted was echinacea root, which was interesting because right. there was no obvious no no obvious issues going on there. Yeah. We were in we have a shop and uh, where we sell all the herbs and the extracts, and he comes in sometimes and he's an absolute nightmare because we have pegs on everything to identify them, and he just loves picking the pegs off and chewing them and running off with a peg. He knows it annoys the hell out of me, right? And he grabs the peg and he legs it and he chews the peg. But this time he pulled out the marshmallow root. This was a few weeks ago. He pulled out the marshmallow root bag and he opened it and he scrubbed it and he started chewing the marshmallow root. So obviously there was something in his gut there that he needed. Some, some marshmallow root is full of saponins. Um, we have it growing out on the farm here. Um, it, it's it's really good to it, it works a bit like slippery elm. It eases the gut. It's an anti-inflammatory and it coats the gut. Um, and so he'd actually selected that himself. So, um, so yeah, so um, he only took on the supplementary, when I was offering him supplementals uh, or nutritional powders, the only thing he took was the echinacea. And I do believe that's because he's on a raw food diet. So if a dog comes to me and they're on a raw food diet and they know they've got the right proportion, so it's like 10% bone, sorry, is it 5% bone, 5% offal, um, 80% that's not right. It's 80% meat, 10% bone, and 10% offal, if I'm right. I might go and double check that later on. Um, but, but as long as you've got the right proportions and the dog's on a good diet, they very rarely actually want supplements. That's my experience. They very rarely actually want uh, sub nutritional powders. Uh, but I do every so often, as you see, I check every so often to see. Yeah. So depending upon if the dog, if the dog, you know, that's, that's, that's on the initial consultation call is yeah. what is what food is your dog on? Because if yeah. you've got a gut issue and you're feeding your dog grain, then the first thing I'm going to say is get them off the grain. Yeah. Um, because grain is just so inflammatory. We know that. We need to feed biologically appropriate without trying to turn this into a, a raw food. Yeah. Area. That, um, um, you know, we really we need to, to feed our dogs biologically appropriately. So that means meat. And it doesn't mean grain. Um, so that's my first. Now, if they say, yeah, they're on grain and they're happy on grain uh, and they don't want to look at anything else, then, of course, the nutritional powders will come out straight away. Um, and there are reasons why some people can't feed raw food if they don't have a freezer, for example. Okay. So, you know, we refrain from judgment. Obviously, the ideal scenario is to have them on a raw food diet uh, or a bath diet. Um, but but if you can't do that, for some people, they just don't even want to touch raw meat, which is understandable too. Yeah. So, um, you know, so so obviously you work with what you have uh, and, and where the dog and the owner is at. And, mm -hmm. and so in the case of a non-bath diet, then, yeah, we would put down nutritional powders. Yeah, okay. And how, how often do you offer it? You say, you know, you, you check... Well, if it was a dog um, on kibble, then maybe three times a week. Right. You know? yeah. But if it's a raw food diet, I once every two, three weeks. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Unless there's obvious presenting symptoms, right? Mm. Unless there's obvious presenting symptoms. Yeah. You know, um, but if you've got the diet right, if you've got the nutrition right, you know, then, then uh, and obviously if it's an older dog, then that's different because an older dog might have difficulty in assimilating vitamins and minerals. Yeah. So then, then I would probably offer spirulina and barley yeah. grass, dandelion root, maybe once a week if it's an older dog that's struggling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. definitely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, very important thing, like are there anything that people shouldn't do? And what okay. I mean by that, I don't want people, you know, to listen to this talk and go yeah. buy essential oils in the shop and put yeah, them in. Yeah. No, I, I know it's obvious for us, but you know what I mean. Yeah, 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 sure. But, I hear you, I hear you. Okay, listen, forget about your essential oils in, from Boots to Chemist. Forget about what you've got in the cupboard. Forget about all of that, right? That is just not going to work. At the very best, you're going to put your dog off. 
at the very worst, you're gonna do some real damage, you know? Okay, so our essential oils, our CO2s, our powders, are, I mean, majority of them are tested certified, certified organic, and that means something, okay? It's not just they're organic, they're certified to a specific standard, okay? That's really important. Um, because you don't, and the powders, again, they are tested, okay? So we buy them and they are tested. We don't test them, but the people who buy them from test them. They test them to make sure they are organic. Because if you've got a sick dog, and even if you've got a healthy dog, you do not want to be putting pesticides and herbicides into that dog, you know? That's just, why would you do that? You know, so it's really, really important to go to a specialist supplier. And we are the only one in Ireland I know there's someone in it, Caroline Ingraham. There's quite a few actually in England. Caroline Ingraham, My Animal Matters, Rachel Not, she supplies as well. There's two or three in England. <clears throat> I am um, obviously Brexit. You know. I know. <laughs> yeah. So we we that's why we cover the whole of Europe because there's nobody else doing it. Uh, <laughs> we're the only one in Europe. Um, so although there is the lady, I think in Paris. Uh, but she's li quite limited compared to us. But it's great to see, you know, everyone getting on board and doing it. Um, so, so yeah, so go to a specialist supplier is the answer there. Um, all our CO2s are organic. They come from the manufacturers, so we know that they've not been messed around with. I'll tell you a horror story, right? I was looking to import uh, kilos and kilos of barley grass from New Zealand, and I was talking to the wholesaler and I said, you know, I like a deal, right? Like everybody, I like a deal. So I said, I tell you what, would you ever, you know, would you consider giving me a reduction if I bought X amount? He said, no, I can't do that. But what I can do, he says, is I can throw in 20 kilos of filler and you can water it down. I'm like, what? And this is organic. And I'm going like, like he, but the way he mentioned it was just so matter of fact. You know, and I just said, no, that's just, A, that's not ethical. B, it's not healthy for the dogs. And and C, goodbye. <laughs> you know, there's just no way. But but obviously that is general practice in the industry. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. So that's sure. why I thought, hold on, I'm not dealing with these, you know, this crowd. Um, so, mm -hmm. so I'm really aware and really careful um, of what, of our suppliers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, as I say, they're cert you know, not just organic, they're certified organic. So they actually, most of the essential oils that we have are. Um, and that's rare, actually. There are very few other suppliers that can say that. Mm -hmm. Very few other suppliers. In fact, I don't think there's anyone that has the level of organic, certified organic that we do in the whole industry. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's a bit of a personal thing for me. We have an organic farm here. Mm -hmm. And underpinning everything I do, my, my daily belief system is about Mother Earth, is about supporting the Earth, right? Because let's face it, we are doing a lot of damage yeah. and we have to survive and our animals have to survive. And it's really important that we respect. So, so I would have more kind of shamanic under, undertones to my work. So I really believe in supporting Mother Nature. And I think that every product that we purchase that's organic is supporting Mother Nature. You know, and it's supporting a healthy, ethical way of farming. So that's why it's kind of a bit of a personal thing I have, you know. Um, and as I say, yeah, within the industry, we have the highest level of organic products uh, because that's where I want it. Uh, it's not just about quality for the dogs. It's quality for everybody, for you, yeah. for me. You know, we don't need any more pesticides and herbicides oh. floating through the air in our water system. Listen, stop me before I get on a rant. Okay. <laughs> okay what people shouldn't do they shouldn't use they should only go to a specialist supplier okay um they should take a course before they even consider um you know doing it at home on their own um they uh, um there are contraindications to be aware of you know so for example um and, and we go through them on the courses we run. Now, we've, there's not one this year, but there'll be a course next year, or maybe a course later in the autumn if we get enough people to sign right. up. People are interested. Maybe, yeah, maybe we will now. <laughs> you know. For, for yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that'll be kind of October, October, end of October time. Um, so, 
Yeah, and there are contraindications. So, for example, if your dog is on steroids or any sort of medication at all, and you give them St. John's wort and they take St. John's wort, which is a possibility, then you're going to reduce the effectiveness of the drugs. So, St. John's wort is known to increase the half life of drugs. So, you know, there are things like that. Total applications is a minefield because dogs have a programming. And that's the trickiest thing with dogs is, you know, they roll over on their belly. Do they want an application on their belly or are they just saying, give me a hug? You know, so so dogs are very, very different to horses or even to cats, because uh, cats, as you know, cats are cats. Well, I don't know if you know, but cats are very, they know exactly what they want and, and they're not trying to appease anybody or not trying to, to you know, dogs can be a lot more sort of, um, pleasing. <laughs> yeah, they, they like to they like to make sure everyone's good in the pack, you know. Um, so yeah, so so um, so there are contraindications to be aware of, and and to how to spot programming versus you know a, a request for topical application. I don't think have I got that's a shame I haven't got that. I worked with a um, I worked with a um, a customs dog. And customs dog were highly, highly uh, well trained to sniff, obviously, to identify different olfactory um, aromatic chemicals. Uh, sorry, to, to, I'm sorry, to, uh, um, they uh, identify different scents. Okay, so they're, sometimes they're trained for money, sometimes they're trained for, for blood, sometimes they're trained for uh, infection, or not necessarily infection for custom dogs, but there are now dogs being trained for infection. To, to spot infection um, and uh, so the custom talk money drugs uh, that sort of thing um, so um, so this custom dog was incredibly effective at um, uh, smelling so yes so it was a dream um, uh, a dream client because she was trained to watch observe the dog and he was trained to smell uh, you know to, to identify different smells and he was just stressed completely he would never clock off. So, and he presented very clearly his right shoulder, very clearly for a topical application, whereas sometimes it can be a bit ambiguous. One of the last thing I wanted to ask you, what are the biggest challenge, like working with dogs and especially rescue dogs, because this is kind of like the subject of so much, but generally, what are the biggest challenge? And potentially the owners, because, yeah, dogs and the owners. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, Obviously, you know, when they come to a new home, they're going to be anxious or maybe possibly anxious and stressed and you're trying to decompress. So during that time, you can offer them linden blossom. So that's floral waters, as we were discussing, yeah. floral waters. So you could quite happily um, offer them quite safely floral waters. You just spray some on your hands. I mean, the key thing is not to run around after the dog, not to put it on bedding that they can't get away from. The, the key... The key aspect or the one thing to remember is to always allow the dog to get away from the aroma. Okay, so what you could do is you could get some cloths, just get a bit of cloth, clean cloth, and spray some linden blossom on that and put that in, um, you know, in the, in the other side of the room. And so that if your dog wants to go to it, he can do, but he can come back and get away from it. Um, in fact, there was a dog. Um, and I did that because he was outside. It was never allowed in the house. So it was a farm dog. And I sprayed and put oils all on the bits of cloth. And what they watched him do is they literally, he would, he would put them under his mattress and then pull them out as and when he needed. And then when he finished smelling them, he put them back under his mattress. He'd lift the mattress up with his mouth and put the pieces of cloth underneath. Beautiful. So you can, you could do that. You could, um, so Lyndon Ross is the big one for trust, Valerian for anxiety, uh, Rose for comfort, um, Cornflag, yeah, cornflag could do, but I would more go with with linden blossom, um, and and rose uh, and valerian, um, um, for for trust issues. I mean, oh, lavender floral water is lovely as well. Um, yeah, so we sell all those at White on Herbals. Um, you can, yeah, White on Herbals dot com online shop. Um, yeah. So. Uh, spirulina as well is something I would offer to a dog. Definitely right. spirulina, especially come. You know, you don't know what he's battling with. Um, uh, you know, nutritionally wise, it's a great nutritional supplement to give them. Again, don't put them in the food. You know, this is you leave it to the side of the the dish, 
um, and and you leave it pure spirulina, and and you know you don't add anything to it other than a little bit of water. Dribble some water onto the side. Some dogs find it just too too dry, so they can use their tongue to bring the water in. So I put it on a plate. You start off with a tablespoon. Put some water, dribble some water to the side, and allow the dog to take as much as they need. And I would literally give them as much as they need. If they if they take 50 grams, if they take 100 grams, absolutely, I let them carry on. And then the next day they'll take less, and the following day they'll take less. And as their body is is uh, fills up with the nutrients and the vitamins and minerals that it needs, they just take less each day. So it it it, it um, reduces for the following days as their body has all they need. So spirulina definitely is another one that you would offer. As again, as I would say, I would stay away from the essential oils if you don't yeah. know how to use them properly. Yeah. So um, is that the one you would use, like you would recommend if people say in the audience just adopted a rescue dog and they're a bit unsettled or thing, you would definitely yeah. recommend those products? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah. again, I would recommend them from a point of view of offering. So yeah, you yeah, yeah. spray them on the dog. You yeah. wouldn't spray them on the bedding. You know, you make sure that you spray them on your hand and offer your hand. Okay, so you offer your hand and then allow the dog to come to your hand. Don't move towards the dog. Allow your dog to come to your hand. Um, and, and if they lick it, they lick your hand, then you can, um, you know, put some on a bowl in front of them and allow them to drink it. Mm. The floral waters. Yeah. yeah. So, so yes, if you've got a rescue dog at home, definitely that that's... So rose, linden blossom, floral water, and valerian floral water. They would be in lavender. Uh, would be right. Quite. And you know, you know, there are other ones like orange blossom, but that's for grief and separation, and that's not something you, you can tackle unless you've done a good bit of training. Uh, 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 because, yeah. because, and especially, you know, when a dog comes into your home as from a rescue center, that he doesn't want to talk about his emotions yet. He just wants to feel oh. safe. Yeah, yeah, he just yeah. wants to feel safe, man. That, yeah, that's yeah. that's the be all and end all. He wants to know he's okay. Yeah, all and the only... force I have initially, most of the dogs, they don't want, they don't, if you offer them, they're like, no, it takes, they need to settle first. And then, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. They need to feel they're safe and, and certainly don't want to start bringing up any emotions, you know? No, no. no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just, just uh, yeah. So, yeah, so that's what I would recommend for people use the sprays. And just really allow the dog the opportunity to get away from the sprays. Don't put them on the bedding. Don't put them on the collars or don't put them on the, um, don't rub them on them. Just, uh, yeah, just allow the dog to come to you. And if they don't take it, just wash your hands and, and just wash it down the sink. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm, okay. Right. Perfect. So I think, uh, I think I'll send that to the, in an email so that, the audience can buy it because I think you you have a coupon as well for the audience if they want Ooh, to buy yes. anything. So Ooh, yes. we will. I will put it in the email. You can say it now, but okay. I will put it in the email. Yes. Uh, well, F F for Finn and P for Paddy. Yeah. Five. So yeah. F F P capital F capital P five and put right. that in the um, coupon check code at okay. checkout. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's just Perfect. one more case I wanted to talk to you about. This yeah, do. Absolutely. <laughs> was, absolutely. Really amazing. This is Kia, right? Right. And Kia um, had um, uh, had a miscarriage of puppies. And she was absolutely distraught, of course. She lost all of her puppies. And she was in the garden. She was kept going into the garden and she kept digging and nesting. <sighs> as they do and digging in the flower bed and creating a nest to have these puppies that she was never going to have. Um, and so I went over to the UK with my kit and she selected and drank mimosa and that's all she had. And it was completely resolved. So again, that just shows how it can resolve the emotional issues. Um, you know, it's really powerful at resolving the emotional issues. I mean, most we know is for grief and chef separation. Yeah. So it was a wonderful story to see an animal get such relief. Um, so yeah, that was key. I just thought it was really outstanding because she has such severe issues, you know, such severe grief. Yeah. And it was presenting itself so in such a traumatic way for everybody, for the family as well. And just that one oil, you know, that was a lot of that one oil. Yeah. Um, you know, it was like 50, 60 quids worth or something in one wow. hit, you know. Wow. 
Uh, and that was in the old days when Mimosa was reasonable. I mean, now prices have actually <coughs> shot up. There's so much, and global warming is something to do with that as well. You know, Arnica's just gone up four times. Right. 400 percent because of the, the the crop was was a disaster last year. Yeah. So, yeah. So anyway, yeah, that was just one last case study that I want to share with you to show how what how powerful yeah. one oil can be. Just one oil. And just one one session, yeah. and that's it. One session, one oil. Wow. And that, wow. uh, that's amazing. Old, um, that's amazing. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yes, yeah, so so. Um, Anything else you would you'd like to add, or is there any other case study that you want to talk about, or any story, you know, of a specific um, rescue dog or whatever that you can think, you know, that really turn around? Yeah, no, there's nothing in particular. I mean, I think we've done quite a lot already. Uh, I know. We've talked about a lot already. Um, I guess I would say to anybody that has a doubt about it, right? Okay, so the, so the biggest problem maybe for some people to get on board with this is that it takes a mental shift. For the last couple of hundred years, we have administered, okay? And now we're talking about offering. So a possible hurdle for people to get on board with this approach is the inability to trust their animal. You know, and, and that, I, and I understand that. I really understand that. I was the world's worst student, you know, when I was training. I go, but why? But why? I don't know. That. You know, it was really difficult for me to actually trust that, um, to trust that the animal would actually know. Um, and that really only comes once you've worked with a couple of dogs and you'll see, I got that took, dog took that. That dog didn't take that. That dog took that. And that dog didn't take anything at all. And that dog took that. So when you've worked for five, six different dogs, you can see, wow, they really are individually selected. Yeah. yeah. And as to say, it takes a mental shift for you to actually, for, for a lot of people to say, uh, to trust their dogs. Because as I say, we come from a, a medical model at the moment that is, is about administering. We go to the expert, the expert tells us what the dog needs and then we administer it. Yeah, and that's where, that's the mainstream at the moment. So for anybody that feels that, oh my God, can I really trust my dog? I say, absolutely. I would say, and if you're unsure, you know, um, come, come to a course and you'll watch a couple of dogs and then you'll be able to see, yeah, different dogs do select differently. And I, 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 I hope to try and show you that from the case studies today. You know, some select a whole load of different extracts, some select just one or two, and some select topical. You know, the customers' dogs want it topically applied. Um, <clears throat> you know, some work just with floral waters, some work with powders and nutritional powders initially. So every dog is so, so different. The only yeah. thing that is the same is that they know exactly what they need. And they and they they know because it's innate. It's absolutely innate. Innate means they're born with that ability. Yeah. So it's not something they learn. They don't have to learn this. It is born. It, they, they're born knowing how to do this. Yeah. And the beauty of it as well is that, from my experience of offering it to my own dogs, is that it can change a day. Like one day they don't want something, and then the day they like, and you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, nothing changed, but it's, it's just the way it is. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the beauty of it, because yes. they really are self-medicating according yeah. to where the physiological body is, the, the, the biology and the chemistry of their body, where it is exactly in that moment. Yeah. The, there's no planning. They're not thinking, no. oh, I had mimosa yesterday, so I think I'll have it today. <laughs> you know, they're thinking, what are my taste buds? What's my what's my olfactory? What's, what's my brain? What's my what's my sympathetic nervous system what's my parasympathetic nervous system telling me i need right now <laughs> you know what's my body telling me and then they'll be guided by that and that's the yeah. difference and, and as i say it's a complete mental shift <laughs> you know to to allow the animal to lead the way um yeah so hmm. i think okay. we we'll end on that note because a beautiful note to end on and yes, thank you so, so much. Thank yeah. you so, so much. It was just mind-blowing, <laughs> even for me. <laughs> for You're welcome. Mind. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me on. And listen, I really hope that, uh, I mean, I should imagine the rescue centres at the moment are really struggling with all the post-COVID dogs. I know a lot of people that, you know, um, uh, talk about that. And, and um, just to anyone that's taken a rescue on, well done, well done, well done. As I said, I've had rescues all my life. Um, and I, I'm, I, I'm once 
uh, you know, I, 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 I'm looking to get us. I'm, I'm scared to say this, but I will be getting another rescue dog very soon. But please don't everybody send me loads of pictures of rescue dogs. But yeah, I need a friend for this guy out here. Um, but but yeah, it's it's so rewarding. It's so rewarding. So well done to everybody who's taken on a rescue. No, I mean it. I'm serious. Well done. It's not. It's not. It's not for the faint-hearted. You know, no, you don't know what you're getting. And, and and you need bags and bags of compassion and understanding. So a big pat on the back and a big ball of bass. Is a ball of bass when you round of applause like in Irish or something? So well done, everybody that's that's taken on a rescue dog because it's much, much needed. Um, yeah. Okay. So hey. thank you. And well done for this, sir, uh, the summit, Jodine. And, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And, and, take and we'll see. We'll see if we have uh, some time to take to take some question or if there yes. are any question. And yes. uh, otherwise, yes. we'll put. I'll send an email as well with obviously the your website and things so that people can order stuff and the kit that you recommended. And uh, yeah, that's it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> thank yeah, you so thanks. much. I'm not great at the marketing selling bit. I'm just keen for people to help their dogs. Yeah, but, um, but yeah, me too. Course, me too. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's important too. You got to keep the old wheel rolling. Um, yes, so we'll go on to some questions and answers now. Yeah. And, and just to say also that um, it, I, I'm not going to be able to advise people on individual extracts for their dogs, for individual conditions, because there's so much history and there's so much to take into consideration. It would be impractical for me to comment on individual, um, you know, what you should offer to your dog for this particular yeah, presenting system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Of course. Okay. All right, how wonderful. Uh, Carly, are you with us? Yay. <laughs> I think you muted. Oh, hold on. I think Carly's sorting herself out. Hello, hello. I think you muted, Carly. Hey. Sorry, I was just try hi, hi, I was just trying to sort out the lighting. That's like I'm in some dark dungeon here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so I think we have a bit of time for a few questions. And they, I've seen that there were a few questions in the chat already. I first have one question because I know we mentioned it like very quickly. Um, like what do you think of, you know, diffusers and candles because – uh, it's it's all about the precaution, you know, because I don't want, I know we mentioned that I don't want people to go and buy any random essential oils, but I would really like you uh, to talk about, yeah, diffusers and like scented candles and that kind of stuff. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, as many people may know, there are loads of these air fresheners that you can plug into the wall. There are candles, Yankee, you know, oh, sorry, don't want to mention any brands there are candles scented candles and as we know the dog's olfactory system is incredibly powerful and so while it might smell very subtle and in the background to us for dogs it's very very strong so i would discourage anybody to use um those automatic aromatic um uh, air fresheners that plug in and also the um uh, scented candles just be very mindful that the dog can smell them far more powerfully than than mm -hmm. we can and um that um uh and, and just allow them either have the windows open or make sure that they can actually leave the the room um uh without uh and so they're not they don't have to be in an area where there are too many aromatic chemicals flying around uh it just might be too overwhelming for them might give them a headache um yeah so that that's something that i feel quite strongly about to not uh use those uh plug-in air fresheners and because for us as, as i say it's just a background smell but for them it's it's an awful lot more powerful yeah, sorry about the darkness um yeah i'm all right when you're dark it's okay <laughs> uh, um, yeah i saw some questions there some good questions do you yeah. want to read them out to me yeah, so the first one we had, so what do you mean by constituents, wench of constituents in the floral waters? 
CO2 powders, etc. Is it like bioactive compounds? Well, what there are, it's a good question. There are active constituents uh, within the plants. They're all, they're all, basically everything you just mentioned there are plants, but produced in, and manufactured in a different way. So therefore, uh, they have a different range of compounds. So let's say hemp essential oil has a different range of compounds or active constituents than hemp CO2. Uh, because they're prepared differently, both from the same plant, but they're prepared differently. Um, and so the, what these active constituents are, they are secondary metabolites, what we call secondary metabolites, which the par plant produces as part of their own uh, defense system or their own first aid system within the plant. OK, so these plants produce secondary metabolites naturally. Um, and, and we're actually cashing in on the plant's first aid box, if you like, or first aid um, supply. Um, as I say, they also, plants also produce these secondary metabolites as a way to deter grazers. You know, garlic uh, tastes very garlicky uh, because they're trying to deter goats and sheep and, you know, wild animals from eating them. So, so um, yeah, so these herbs that we use to offer all have a various different range of secondary metabolites, uh, which um, are naturally occurring in the plant. I hope that answers the question. I hope so. Otherwise, <laughs> I'm sure they will come back as a rice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, other one. My dog does like to eat grass. Do we let them self medicate? Do we look to try and remedy with something else? Thanks. This is so interesting. Good question. You're very welcome. I find it fascinating too. Dogs will often eat grass to purge, okay? So it's a natural, for us as humans, when we get sick, you know, if we vomit, we think, oh my God, something's wrong. You know, but for dogs, it's a perfectly natural process to purge. It's far more natural for them to purge. Um, and quite often they'll use grass to purge. Uh, as for individual cases, I would say it's perfectly fine for a dog to eat grass. Obviously, you want to give them access to nice, clean grass. You know, you don't want them necessarily eating the grass along the verges and generally of a road. And generally, they won't select grass that, that's that's um, you know not healthy. You'll see that they don't just go for the first patch of grass. They'll 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 be very specific about which blades of grass they will um, uh, eat. And sometimes they'll eat, as I say, to, to purge and sometimes to adjust the acidity in the gut. Um, I would allow any dog to eat grass. Certainly I would do. Um, if they were doing an awful lot of it, I might consider saying, OK, so what, what's, you know, what's the diet? What's happening with the diet? What's happening with the gut? Um, is there anything possibly that we could offer to help um, balance the gut another way? You know, if it's excessive, I would say, yeah, we could have an issue going on here. But the odd bit of grass, absolutely no problem with that at all. Okay, great. Next, is there a floral water for emotional issues for pain in the back legs? Okay. okay, so there's two things going on there. There's pain in the back legs and possibly emotional issues. Um I, I'm not sure which lady it was that, that put that uh, question in, but you can't always assume that an emotional issue is linked to the leg. I, I, maybe there's something um, that she knows that, that's not coming through in the question, so maybe I don't have all the information. But let's say, for example, if I thought there was an emotional issue and it was coming through as as, as um, pain in the legs or immobility, I would offer Arnica. So Arnica is for um, historical pain, but but also St. John's Wort, if it's nerve pain, um, it depends, uh, really depends upon what the dog actually selects. Offering Arnica, again, as I say, that's probably you'd need to know what you're doing as regards to offering a, a CO2 like Arnica. Um, and also you wouldn't just offer the one extract. However, if the lady wanted to have a go, you could offer St. John's Wort floral water. That might be um, something that would, would help. Or rose. Um, they're very simple to offer floral waters. You can't go too far wrong on those. Um, but I'd be interested to know why is she associating emotional with the back legs? I'm not saying it's not. I'm just saying there's a bit of information there that, that maybe I need to, before I could further answer that question properly. Yeah, Jane, it was from Jane. If you have any more uh, information to give us, you can just add it and we'll come back to that question. Mm. Maybe. Mm. Uh, now we have another one from Kat. I'm loving this cat. It's so interesting. Thank you. Quick question. If a dog shows no interest in a remedy, 
that you think would fit for presenting symptoms at the beginning of a session, should you wait for it again further down the line after he has selected other remedies, rather than discard it straight away? Interested in what you were saying about the potentially many layers that he may need to resolve before he can address others. Wow, now that sounds like an expert in zoo pharma. We're going to see that. <laughs> and actually, I know Kath, and she is a very good practitioner. Well, she's very good uh, with oils and extracts. She knows a lot about it herself. Um, yeah, good question, Kath. And and um, absolutely, you can re-offer an extract. So so let's say, you know, let's take an oil for an example. Um Let's say, let's go back to Arnica because that's a very popular one. So let's say you, you really sense that this dog has pain, um, uh, you know, when it walks uh, uh, and it's, it's not accepted any painkillers or it's not interested in any painkillers, uh, but it wants to work with the emotional side of things. You know, it might be uh, uh, taking oils for the heart and yet you can see it's quite obvious there's pain in the back legs um and and yet it is not interested in any analgesics and it just wants to go straight for the um emotional things you then might at a, another a, a, another stage uh, later on in the session offer analgesics so st john's wort arnica uh, roman chamomile german chamomile um the um devil's claw powder uh peppermint uh, so it's another nervine. So you would uh, St. John's Wort macerate as well as St. John's Wort floral water. So so uh, wintergreen, birch, other ones. Um, so so you might come back um, to the analgesics when you finish working with the emotional issues, you know, say the heart. And yeah, layers are a really big issue. Um, there's so often you sort of, the, the, the most obvious presenting symptom quite often isn't the one the one the dog wants to work with quite often there's something underlying um and it that's so common it's just so common so and that's why this is so effective because you're being led by the dog so the dog knows where the issue is where the root is what they want to work with first um and that's what makes it so effective that is what makes it so effective because you know an expert comes along and, and vets are great and and as i say we work with them regularly and but they've only got their their diagnosis is limited to the equipment that they have you mm -hmm. know um and there's so much pain that can't be seen on on through through various different means of diagnosis uh particularly pain from trauma um mm -hmm. and uh, historical pain you know so amputees um uh, neutering all those sort of scars that still may have shock and pain in it so so those sort of layers you know can come up one by one and uh, when you get a weakness in the body quite often another uh, dis-ease will sort of cling on will will see it as a vulnerable spot and and then um uh and and then make itself known and then and then will cause a problem for example you might have a gut issue um, and, and that may be of a deeper emotional nature or there might be something stuck in the gut. But then the dog um, manifests a skin issue on top of that, it might get a fungal infection on top of that. That's very common uh, because it, the fungal issue, fungal infection isn't the main issue, but it's been able to get a grip because there's a weakness in the system elsewhere. So the fungal infection is secondary, if you like. Okay, that's layers, and yeah, thank you, Kath, for that. Um, is there a training course for this, please? And I think you mentioned it, October. So yeah, October, we'll probably run another one online. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in the meantime, if anyone else wants to help, then we have a clinic here, uh, but we are in Sligo, um, but also we do it through Zoom as well. Um, yeah. And I send the products out, and yeah. then we had a Zoom session, and then the it's it's – it's, it depends upon what people want, if their dog is okay to travel or not, or if they feel competent or feel that they would be happy to be guided by myself. Yeah. It's a number, but we can discuss all of that. You know, there are various different options. Yeah. What I'll do, I will, uh, I will send an email tomorrow um, to your website, obviously, because you also have a, 
a code, a discount code, if people yes. want to buy some products, yeah, then, uh, yeah, they can, yeah, they can do that and sure. uh, the courses and stuff, and also, um, yeah, if you don't, if you haven't registered and you want to get that email, just put the email in the comments as well, just in case, <laughs> and but I'll remind you tomorrow anyway. And finally, we have a last question, which is from Amelie, which is somebody I know. <laughs> Hello. So, hello, my rescue dog is very stressed when we take her in a car. Lots of drolling, really a lot, and shaking. When the car ride is finished, she's, of course, exhausted also, so not fun for her to take her to the forest, for example, except for taking her as much as we can for her to get used to the car. Is there a way to reassure her or calm her with pharmacognosy? Well, there could be a couple of things going on there. Um, I wouldn't say that anxiety, I would say anxiety is a secondary um, manifestation of a deeper issue. There could be pain that it hasn't been diagnosed, or there could also be gut issues. Um, and and those are two areas that I would look to straight away. Um, yeah, uh, and that's very common. There was a guy, did, did we have Max up? Did I show Max as a case study? And the, the presentation. Sorry, I was listening and looking, but I was just... It doesn't, it doesn't know. It doesn't it doesn't okay, so Max, we, he came to the workshop. He was one of our uh, participants on the workshop. Uh, it was a dog. He is a dog, a collie, lovely little fella. And he was incredibly anxious in the uh, in travelling. And he would diarrhea everywhere i mean luckily enough the woman had a kind of a four by four and she'd have a crew cab in the back so whilst he could see out he was still you know he was, she would put paper down and he would always diarrhea everywhere. so anxious crying yelping jumping up and down a real nightmare and and he never got used to it until she she well he it didn't matter how much she did it he wouldn't calm down so she brought him here for the session and it was interesting enough because he had lost it was it, the base was emotional and he had lost his best pal and uh, he, two best pals. So he was one of three dogs on a farm. And he had lost his two friends in the space of about two weeks of each other. So, he, so uh, it was kind of really, it was incredible because we were working with the energy network of the owner as well. And he took Mimosa. And then we handed the grief oils to the owner and she didn't want mimosa, but she wanted neroli and she was in tears and they both had grief oils. Um, and after that, the traveling was absolutely fine. So whatever it was, maybe it had manifested physically uh, or maybe it was her grief that was affecting him, his grief affecting her. But we worked with them together and. Um, and that it was the most significant or the most memorable because, you know, they both selected oils for grief, but they selected two different oils. So do you remember Kia that lost her puppy? She selected mimosa. Um, and so, so there were two different extracts here uh, for oils to offer for grief and the owner and the dog selected for grief, but different extracts. So that was fascinating. And he was absolutely it, it, fine because he came back the next day and she was just, she, we have it on, you know, we, have, we record all our workshops and we have it all on um, Zoom. And she was just, it, she was absolutely, on the first day when she was taking the grief, she was quite upset. And she was talking about, you know, uh, her two, the two dogs that she'd lost within a couple of weeks of each other and how poor old Max had, had been in the middle of this grief. Um, and, um, and uh, yeah, and he's travelled fine after that. So, there was no obvious physical pain and yet emotionally he suffered. And for some reason it manifested in the traveling. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was quite unusual. Um, so for this lady who has, it was a German shepherd. I, I sorry, I can't remember. No, it's, um, oh, did you, did you talk about the, the car traveling thing? Yeah. The car traveling. No, th there's more information. Cause I know. Oh. Well, and my dog was traumatized by transport when I rescued her. So it was for 72 hours in a truck, West 20 uh, with screaming dogs. Um, and the vet never diagnosed her with gut issue. Now, yeah, doesn't mean to. <laughs> so that's what I want to say. Like, uh, it, it could be related to the transport but just absolutely it could be absolutely it could be yeah. uh but i and and certainly that would be in my mind you know um uh that would certainly be something you would offer would be oils for trauma definitely so linden blossom 
um, and yarrow. But yarrow is a very, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend she go out and buy some yarrow. And it, it's really dealing with trauma is something that we don't go into deeply into the masterclass. You know, it's really, you can do, you know, you don't want to do any damage. You know, you, if emotions come up, you want to be able to deal with them carefully uh, mm -hmm. and, and responsibly. Um, so, so yeah, gosh, the poor little fella. Um, yeah, so trauma would be something you would offer for. But also, you know, it's in the same way you'd offer for pain, because trauma does manifest as pain. We mm -hmm. know that now. The studies have shown that when people are traumatized, they have physical pain in their body, uh, and when it's it's when there's no evidence, there's no physical diagnosis. So mm -hmm. we now uh, know that um, you know trauma leaves physical pain in the body. Um, so yes, um, yeah, wow, poor little fella, oh, oh, darling. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Cool. Well, fair play to that lady for uh, rescuing the dog, and all of you rescue owners and. Even without rescuing, you know, you're still going to come up across stuff around trust and things like that and physical pain. And traveling, of course, is when it all comes out, you know. Yeah, mm. of course. Mm. Yeah. Well, what I'll do, I think I'll wrap it up because we have the other session very soon. So oh. I, need, I need to take a break. I need to, to let the dogs out a bit. I think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We might be a bit late for the other session now, but uh, what I'll do, yeah, I'll send uh, the, your website on the on the email so that people can contact you. And if, yeah, if Amelie, you want to talk to Carly about Mia, uh, you probably can do a Zoom with her as well. It's about uh, the dog with a transport issue. Right. So, yeah, so I'll put that all in an email and then people can reach out to you because otherwise we're going to be talking about this probably until yeah. tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yes okay well listen thank you so much everybody for tuning in sorry i'm in the dark here i'm not quite sure what went on there i don't know what happened with the screen but um thank you so much everybody for listening uh to me blab on about my favorite subject uh i love it and uh yeah thank you so much geraldine for doing all the hard work and setting this up incredible amount of work fair play to you well done and thank you so much geraldine thank you carly thank you <laughs> Okay. Bye-bye, oh, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, bye, -bye. We, bye guys. We might run a bit late for the next one, but we'll try and be there at 8 o'clock, hopefully. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Thank